So this morning, we have the pleasure of having uh, a Bitcoin historian, entrepreneur, and mining world record holder, Kurt Walker Jr., to share with us what he's building at Gorilla Pool. Kurt, welcome to the webinar today. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate it. Just take it away. Take it away. All right. Lord beautiful. yours. <laughs> so th there's an interesting dilemma in doing a demonstration of a mining pool, uh, given that we are widely distributed and deeply infrastructural. So it's kind of like, give a tour of Verizon. And it's like, well, you can go to a corporate office or you can go to a switching station or you can go see uh, satellite infrastructure or heavy, heavy uh, communication lines out in the field or whatever. Um, so it makes it a little bit uh, difficult to, to bring down to a scope that can be consumed in 30 minutes over a Zoom call. Uh, and this is why we have slideshows. But I can do, uh, I'm going to go through a few things. I, I think one of the key things to remember is that in infrastructure, specifically uh, in the Bitcoin space, um, software, software can run on anybody's server or it can just run on your computer locally. And if you have no users, or, or a very small amount of users, you can put it on a home computer and that'll work quite well for you. But in the Bitcoin space, uh, we have a distribution challenge, we have a synchronization challenge, and then we have the challenge of uh, trying to get large amounts of data done in a very specific way because it's the specific method by which data is, um, is created, consumed, digested, uh, and then repropagated uh, that makes it valuable. So it's this ability to attach monetary value or money, I guess, uh, to, to any byte of data on the whole network. So here's a very brief uh, overview on what, what Bitcoin is actually doing. What, it, what is Bitcoin mining? Because I think a lot of people, um, you know, they see those specialized computers and ASIC miner and say, that's mining. That's what mining is, or that's what mining does. And it's, not really the whole picture. Uh, I actually don't even like the word mining to describe that. Uh, that machine is a specialized hasher. And so what that is doing is just going through a table of transactions. Uh, actually not a table of transactions, going through a table of hashes to look for a sufficiently uh, difficult hash to find on a hash table. And what that is, is it is wasting energy for the sake of showing that you care enough to invest the money to waste that energy to find the hash so that people can trust you in an adversarial environment. And this is kind of like, um, you know, I tell people like, hey, maybe I won't open my door uh, every time somebody knocks on my door. Like I just, I don't care to talk to every single person who wants to talk to me. But if I have a little sign on the door that says, I need you to knock exactly 10,000 times. And if somebody's willing to knock 10,000 times, then I have to presume, well, the information that they want to give me must be important. Uh, at the very least, I, I should uh, treat it with the presumption that maybe it's important. And um, so if you're willing to do that, I'm willing to trust your information more than somebody who says, ah, forget it. I'm not going to knock 10,000 times. So that's a very basic analogy on why proof of work matters. It's, it's a signaling mechanism. Um, but what happens with Bitcoin is you have a Bitcoin wallet. So you, you have a wallet on your phone or your computer, you broadcast a transaction. Let's just say it's a simple payment from a friend to a friend. Uh, either the sender or the receiver must broadcast that to the network to check for double spends. Uh, double spend is like a bad check. So if you write a check at grocery store A, and then you on the same day write a check at grocery store B, if they both have a you know mail in the check system as opposed to some digital verification system, uh, then you can basically get away with um, getting twice as much groceries for the same amount of money. Of course, you've also just committed fraud. Um, but when it's by accident, nobody really cares. Um, I mean, you'll get a balance charge or whatever. But but in a basic sense, that's what a double spend is doing. Bitcoin uses a distributed computing system, basically computers around the world, to check for double spend. So if I attempt to double spend, the network should automatically reject it because it is validating that transactions are are real and not double spent. And so that's what my company does in the most basic sense. Gorilla Pool receives broadcast transactions. We validate that they follow all of the rules of the network and that they are not attempting to be uh, a malicious thief in some way. We do it with a sufficient amount of proof of work, meaning that uh, we have solved the hash table or we've found a valid hash on that hash table. And then we broadcast a block. So when we say, 
hey, here's a one megabyte block or a one gigabyte block, or hopefully in the future, you know, petabyte blocks of data that we have validated and uh, given back to the network and say, hey, here is a completely valid block. Please build on our block to confirm that you agree that this block is good. And this is the very basic uh, thing that Bitcoin does for the world. So I'm essentially, uh, my company, Gorilla Pool, is something like an auditor and an accountant and a gigantic industrial uh, communications operation because it's got to do all things and it's got to do them all really well. Uh, for that, we are rewarded with the block reward and uh, transaction fees. Now, in a Bitcoin world, um, th we've got this, this little Bitcoin civil war about whether we want to have very small blocks and very high priced coins and transactions, or do we want to have very big blocks that have lots and lots of small transactions or the optional large transaction, but but ultimately each transaction being small, uh, in my opinion, is the way to go because it allows people to build much more disruptive systems uh, by creating applications that utilize micropayments. Uh, in my opinion, micropayments are the key thing that Bitcoin disrupts about the world, allows us to disrupt everything from uh, global finance, SWIFT payments, ACH, wire, uh, checks, cash, uh, and all kinds of things in the internet stack, including digital identity, ownership of digital assets, and a whole bunch of other things. So here's what our company, our uh, tech stack is structured like. So you have the Bitcoin network all the way on the left. We have our nodes, which right now we are running five nodes and five data centers. Um, they are distributed around the world, both for uh, political reasons and for just uh, distribution. So if like the U.S. says, hey, no more Bitcoin mining. Well, we've got stuff in uh, Germany and we've got stuff in Finland. And if uh, Finland gets invaded by Russia, OK, so we're distributed out. You know, so just that kind of thing, just uh, geographical uh, distribution for the sake of persistence. Then we have our pool that lays atop the node infrastructure. And what the pool allows us to do is it allows us to have our own hash power. So we have our own mining uh, hashing equipment, but it also allows you to participate. So if you want to buy an ASIC hashing rig, uh, and we sell them by the way. So if you want to buy them and get into the mining business, I can I can help you do that. We can uh, host them for you and you simply pay the electric bill, uh, but it allows us to collectivize. So we have about 60 partners right now that are mining with us and they uh, they, they contribute as, as little or as much proof of work as, as they are able. Uh, some of our people have you know over $100,000 worth of hashing equipment invested uh, and a good number of people simply have one rig, which costs you know three thousand dollars or something like that to get into, uh, and then a roughly two hundred to two hundred and fifty dollar electric bill per month uh, that they are paying uh, to hash with us. And then we distribute rewards relative to the pool size. So if you're one percent of our pool, then you get one percent of the rewards when we uh, build a block. Here's a picture of me. Uh, I'm standing inside of a specialized hashing pod. Uh, this one is specifically a hydro-cooled pod. So you can see over my right shoulder, uh, there's all those tubes that are looped uh, through. This entire uh, thing is purpose-built. It's kind of like a shipping container, but when you go inside, it is a purpose-built data center uh, with very specific um, hydro engineering that goes into uh, water flow, air flow, uh, of course, electricity and networking because each machine is its own computer. Uh, they are very, very specialized uh, pods. We uh, sell and distribute these as well. This is the Titan model, and uh, and we operate them. So it is uh, it's a it's a heck of an industrial operation. Uh, when you hear these things, you can hear them from a mile away. They sound like a, a churning train in many regards. Uh, these are some of the the switches. Uh, so these are just breaker boxes that are on one side of the uh, pod. Uh, you can also see our our data. Uh, basically servers. They're just high power computers. These are actually doing the computation of blocks and validating signatures and, and doing all the other Bitcoin stuff. And then here's some of our uh, logistical stuff. So this is, uh, you can see the fans on the, on the front of these ASICs on the middle computer. And then you can just see pallets of these ASIC computers. Uh, we buy a lot of stuff from China. Uh, most of the stuff is manufactured either in China or Malaysia. Uh, I actually prefer the Malaysian models because you don't have to pay a tax. Uh, there's like a 25% tax to import uh, Chinese manufactured uh, computers into the US. So the Malaysian ones are considerably cheaper to bring in. Uh, and, and we are a, a truly global operation. Uh, so we, we do have 
uh, people working in Asia, Europe, and North America. So sorry, Australia and Africa, I, I guess, and South America, but uh, we got the, the Northern Hemisphere covered anyways. So here's a little map uh, distribution of what we're doing in different locations on the US side. So we have a Texas data center, Florida data center. Uh, we have hashing in North Carolina, Quebec, and a place called Rock Island, Washington. Um, very simple. So hashing and data, they are distributed. So this is, uh, think of it as basically a giant computer, but they communicate to each other over the internet. And this is what some of our European locations look like. We do have a London, a Frankfurt, and a, I forget the name of the town in Finland, but we have a Finland location as well. Uh, this is just doing data services. This allows uh, us to accept transactions, uh, build out uh, blocks, and then send data out to whoever needs it. Um, our, it's, in that regard, is not a terribly dissimilar operation to what any mining company is doing. That's, that's kind of where we uh, do the basics, and every miner is doing roughly the same thing in that regard. But here's where we get different. Uh, this is Jungle Bus. So one of the interesting things about data in the blockchain space is that it's increasingly difficult to run a node for. However, when you are running a business, like if you're going to run a business that utilizes blockchain data as part of your business model, there hasn't really been a, a practical way to avoid running that full node, which is an increasingly uh, difficult cost, specifically on the BSV blockchain, because as the node gets larger and larger, and as blocks get larger and larger, you need more and more powerful computers, better internet connections, et cetera. Right now, it costs you about a thousand bucks a month to rent cloud server uh, node space uh, if you were to do it yourself. Um, and that's just unacceptable uh, for a lot of startups, frankly, especially when you know a BTC node you can run for 12 bucks a month or, or something like that. Uh, of course, they're doing completely different things. Uh, BTC is, has been um, purpose-built to be very small and lightweight, but only do simple uh, payments, whereas BSV is doing all of these other complicated things. So what we did is we built Jungle Bus, which uh, basically digests blockchain data uh, and then pre-filters it for you. And it allows you as an application developer to filter out just the information you need. So maybe you only want uh, transactions that are related to a specific communications protocol, because you want to have encrypted chat over the blockchain as part of your application. Uh, so you can subscribe uh, and build your own index on your side that's fed by Jungle Bus. Uh, and you're paying maybe $5 a month for a Firebase account uh, that keeps your uh, transaction data up to date and, and verified by a miner on the network, the people that are doing the actual validation of that stuff. Uh, or you can build something much more complicated. So you can build things that every single image or even your website itself is served from the blockchain. Like these are all ideal customers for Jungle Bus. Uh, and we really don't have a competitor. Nobody is offering this sort of service because uh, a lot of people just aren't kind of past the basic blockchain stuff and in the, in the theory space. Uh, but we, uh, we have paying customers right now that are using data uh, to build really cool stuff. In fact, we've seen kind of an explosion of, of uh, excitement around uh, specific tokens and, and things, and, and Jungle Bus is an ideal indexing tool uh, for serving that. Now, in serving that data, it allows you to build what's essentially a replacement for the internet. Uh, we call this a metanet. It can integrate with the existing meta, uh, internet, but then we believe that it will replace the internet as a whole. Instead of the internet sending packets from server to server, uh, you can replace the TCP IP level of the internet with Bitcoin itself. And those kind of data packets can be sent over transactions, which allows you to encrypt, decrypt, monetize every bit of data, uh, have ownership of every single bit that goes across a system. Uh, and so this is kind of our, our long-term goal here is to see the internet itself ultimately replaced by an internet of value. Uh, and again, this requires a tool like Jungle Bus to serve that information in a lightweight fashion uh, because you know people out there today are not likely to run an email server or run a um, you know your your own server website. Like you're likely to just use Wix or Squarespace or you know Google Gmail uh, these kind of things. And so we're trying to create that infrastructure uh, to allow a metanet to be built. So one of the issues is how do I send transactions, especially at high speed, to the network? Um, so we 
not not just we. Uh, so Gorilla Pool teamed up with Bitcoin Association and people from Tal, which is one of our competitors in the mining space, to kind of rethink this problem uh, and say, hey, how can we receive 50 million transactions in a day? Because this is not something that we had done ever. Uh, and so we built the ARC transaction engine. This is basically just an ingestion engine uh, to, to take in transactions and serve them properly and make sure we don't lose anything on the way. Uh, so this is something that we're really proud to have uh, helped build. Uh, I believe we were the first to deploy it uh, and our ARC endpoint is up now. Um, if you've ever tried to use a tool called Mappy or if you've ever tried to broadcast anything to a blockchain when there's a lot of congestion, uh, you probably have experienced the like, hmm, fail to broadcast, fail to broadcast, error, error, error. And it's very frustrating, uh, especially when we uh, claim to be able to scale. So we, we believe this brings us uh, to a level of scale that nobody can touch in the blockchain space uh, by, a, by a very wide margin. We're talking uh, potentially an exponential uh, jump in efficiency and the ability to broadcast transactions uh, to the network. So our business model, uh, we're trying to receive transactions better than anybody, process them more efficiently, and then ultimately serve that data back out to allow people to build their Web3 style business. Um, and for that, I don't have a slide that explains this, but it's very much why we see ourselves as, as only a Bitcoin miner in the most basic sense. But truly, I think our business will be called something like uh, Web3 ISP or something like that in the near future when people start to realize, hey, you can build on Bitcoin and it's really, really cool. Uh, here's some of our clients, a lot of people that are using our uh, infrastructure and they lean on our stuff uh, so that they don't have to run um, big infrastructure. So that is my basic presentation, but I can also bring you over to look at a couple of our superlatives. Let me try to share my... And do you, do you have any, any product demo you're able to do today? I'm, I'm going to walk through uh, a handful of things here. Um, right. Honestly, it would just be a lot of, lot of numbers and code, and I don't think it would be particularly interesting for okay. most people. Uh, but good. here's a... So here's an example of, of something that is possible. This is a this is a world record setting block that we mined. There are 2.5 million transactions in this block. It is 3.8 gigabytes of of total data. Uh, this was mined, gosh, about a year, maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, but the fee the fees in here 9.75 coins in fees on top of the 6.25 coin subsidy that is inherent in Bitcoin during this era. Um, the beauty of this is that two and a half million transactions in a block paid at this rate allows us to uh, pay for itself. Uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is an economic system. And right now, uh, the average number of coins total in a block is fewer than seven. Uh, and this is across all variations of Bitcoin right now. And uh, that is not sustainable. When the next halvening comes, which is in roughly two years now, um, that's going to cut down to three and an eighth uh, coins per block. And so you need to replace that with fees. And truly, uh, there's like two companies on earth that have even explored what that looks like to be able to receive lots and lots of transactions. And, and we're one of them. Uh, we're the much smaller one by uh, total market cap and valuation. Uh, on paper anyways, but uh, we hold most of the world records for scaling here. Uh, and this is just an example of one of those blocks that I'm uh, particularly proud of. Uh, I'm going to cut over to uh, some of our other stuff here. This is the back end of our pool. Uh, one of the interesting things, so we actually are, are basically the only miner that mines on the BSV testnet. Uh, which is where lots of crazy stuff happens. <laughs> so uh, if you think the, the main net does some wild stuff, test net is, uh, is extra spicy and we are basically maintaining it by ourselves uh, for the sake of um, just, just doing really cool stuff. So you can see some status. Uh, we have about 18 petahash right now uh, on the network, which is good for probably four or 5% of the BSV network right now. It's a, it's a healthy chunk, but not a huge one. Uh, we have 62 individual accounts. So this is not individual ASICs. Some of our miners, uh, quote unquote miners, uh, have you know 30 ASICs on one account. So um, that's, that's where we're at. This is basic network stats. Uh, dashboard, you can search. Um, 
you know, here's here's one here's one account. So this guy's got 35 ASICs on his account that are doing uh, different things. Tells you status. Uh, he's been paid seven coin or seven and a quarter coins today. He's received 500 over time. Uh, here's all of our minor accounts right now. Oh, actually, it's considerably smaller than it was last I checked the other day, uh, which is fine. People can come and go as they please. Uh, we have a few big pools that uh, hop in and send us hash power, but they, again, they come and go as they please. Here's our blocks. So I always say that we punch above our weight. Um, we, the fact that we get roughly 5% of the network means we should get 5% of blocks. Uh, and effort should always trend toward 100%. But you can see our effort here. Here's 11. Here's 111. So that one was a little big, but this one's three and then 19. Uh, now this one was a little, uh, little more than, than we would like, obviously. So anytime that we can be below 100% effort, this is good for us. Uh, and given some of our optimizations, some of our proprietary stuff that we've created, we tend to uh, trend better than 100% effort uh, on that thing, which is very cool for us. But let's talk a little bit about uh, Jungle Bus again. So this is in public beta right now, but we are very, very close to making this uh, fully commercialized. Um, it allows people to simply subscribe. You don't even really need to call us or, or anything, although we're happy to uh, walk you through how to do it. But people, it's, it's completely self-serve uh, and you can jump in and build stuff with, with Jungle Bus today. Um, and, and people are doing it right now. Actually, Joshua Hensley, who I know is uh, quite close to the Unbounded Capital folks. He may even be on this call. I haven't noticed, but uh, he is using Jungle Bus right now. Uh, to issue uh, tokens that have individual uh, images and sounds and are supposed to integrate to a game or something in the very near future. And he is serving all of that data to himself over Jungle Bus uh, as a client. So here's our, our documentation page. So we have documentation for Jungle Bus, Arc, Mappy, and then the pool itself. The pool has its own APIs for blockchain data if you want to access that. Uh, so our Jungle Bus docs, I'm also very proud of. I think they are uh, quite clean and descriptive and allow any developer to build basically whatever they want using Bitcoin today. Um, and if you have something else that you'd like us to serve, so if you have a very specific business use case, uh, we, can, we can add it and then synchronize it and then serve you that data too. We just need to know what the the economy wants from us. Uh, so we, we purposely built this in a modular fashion. So we're very nimble. Um, just in the last uh, two weeks, there's been a new token protocol called OneSat Ordinals, which has made everybody very excited. Uh, and we were able to get infrastructure and endpoints up for OneSat Ordinals in about 48 hours, uh, including the indexing and resyncing of, of the index. So uh, we, are, we are quite nimble in that regard. And uh, we make it very, very, very easy to build, uh, build your blockchain application. Similarly, we have uh, you know docs for Arc. Um, I also really like these docs. I think they're easy to understand, easy to use, makes it uh, pretty simple to understand what's happening here. And um, if you're not a developer, it's it's all going to be gibberish anyways. But uh, in a very basic sense, that's the uh, that's the demonstration. That's that's our company. Uh, I would love to do a site tour someday if anybody wants to go see some ASIC hashing and go put on a hard hat and see see the the crazy magic happen. I'm very happy to organize that with anybody who's interested. Where do you live, Kurt? I'm in South Florida, so I'm I'm broadcasting from the South Florida Bitcoin Citadel right now, which is a co working space that I'm partnered in. Um, I'm in I'm Delray Beach, Florida, so just uh, maybe 40 miles north of Miami. Where would the uh, uh, um, facility tour take place? In Florida? Or are there so, other facilities that you can give tours in? We do have a partner uh, that's a little north of us. It's not one of our facilities, but it is about an hour north of where I'm at today. Uh, and we share a lot of work. Uh, so we have a good huh. relationship. It's a good spot. Uh, but we could also do Washington State. We'll do tours, uh, and we have a spot in North Carolina that would be very happy to do tours as well. Great. Well, it looks like we have an audience uh, question. So, Joseph. Uh, yeah. Quick, quick question, Kurt. Good to see you again. Um, you what is the ask today? Are you are you looking for capital for your miners independently? Like, I, maybe I missed that. Um, honestly, I'm not necessarily asking for anything. Uh, we we do. 
we do think that there's an opportunity for anybody to come in quickly uh, to be able to buy ASIC hashing power. Um, it's profitable uh, pretty quickly. Um, you know, a, a $10,000 investment will uh, ROI likely in less than 18 months. Uh, and then you have a cash flowing asset. Also, the, the ASICs, when you buy them in a bear market, have a tendency to go up in value even as they um, age. So a used ASIC miner <clears throat> that was purchased now for something like $3,000, if we're in a serious bull market in two years, uh, you might have gotten two years of use out of the thing and be able to resell it for seven, eight, nine thousand dollars uh, This is what it looked like on the last cycle. Uh, and I've been mining since 2013. So I've now seen it in uh, two full cycles where uh, in a bear market, they are basically worthless. But in a bull market, the ASIC itself has gone up uh, two or 300 percent. And then, of course, you have the uh, accrual of value of your coins as well. So if you're interested in hashing with us, um, we would we would be very happy to uh, help you get set up. Uh, we offer hosting and, and everything. We've worked out all those logistics where you basically just uh, wire us money or send us some coins and, and we can make that happen for you. Yeah. Why don't we have a conversation offline uh, for sure about that? Thanks. Yep. Thanks, Joseph. And yeah, just for reminding everyone here, you know, some um, sometimes we bring on guests that have asked, but honestly, most of the time for the Inmatter Perspectives webinar, uh, we're just looking to have good conversation. Um, and, you know, I do hope that various business opportunities flow from this, but often, you know, not, not directly. Um, so yep. we have a question from the ever conscientious um, Unbounded Capital webinar uh, attendee and investor, uh, Kurt Overly. So Kurt asks, please expand on the potential future path for a BSV powered meta net to disrupt the current internet. And Kurt, uh, with the nice shirt, please limit your answer to maybe five minutes because I know this could be a, you know, a long essay filled yep. question answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th this could be a, a documentary series, frankly. Uh, so, I mean, the, the Web2 Internet was designed to be a mix of open protocols that empowered people to uh, get closer, communicate better, uh, use their identity and payments in ways that generate all kinds of value. Um, you can look at the launch of Twitter, which is now, gosh, 15 years ago or something. Uh, and they were an open Internet protocol. They wanted... Uh, people to be able to build Twitter clients. In fact, if you were a Twitter user way back then, you might remember using custom Twitter clients to access the Twitter API. Well, then they shut all that down. Um, the ad model took over the internet and the way that almost every business makes money in this space. So some of the biggest companies in the world, your Facebooks, your Twitters, uh, your Googles, et cetera, um, they are just scraping your data and reselling it uh, partially to each other and then partially to uh, complicated and often shady uh, marketing organizations and government organizations. And this is where like 99% of their revenue comes from. So that ad model has made it that uh, everything about the Web2 space is about curating experiences that are digestible and profitable for advertisers. And that's led to a very weird internet posture where uh, bots have taken over. Uh, we have people like nobody trusts anybody anymore. You presume that uh, some, some large percentage of the people you're interacting with are Russian bots or, or you know, political infiltrators from some other thing. And, and you know, now we, we bicker. The internet has turned into a place to bicker and distrust each other. Now, if we transition to a proof of work powered internet, uh, an internet that is, is built on the ability to transmit data directly, all of a sudden you're able to start to cut out the advertisers and say, you know what? Uh, I don't necessarily need to curate my speech such that it benefits uh, you know, Nike or, or, or BlackRock or, or whoever else. Uh, it allows you to have a truly peer-to-peer -peer internet where we're interacting directly with each other in a way that can be monetized uh, very deliberately uh, instead of the YouTube model where you need a thousand followers in order to monetize it all and you need like a million views to, to get a few hundred dollars a month. Uh, so you need to be a very, very big channel on YouTube to, to even get close to turning that into a full-time 
uh, opportunity, like a, you know, a career that is worth your time. On the flip side, uh, if we're able to directly monetize, maybe you make your information pay per view or pay per click very, very trivially and say, okay, we'll stream our information from the blockchain. And in order to access it, I want you to pay a dollar. Maybe, it, maybe it's really valuable information and you want to pay $5 or $10 or, or whatever the market will bear. But ultimately, um, actually, I'll, I'll bring up Joshua Hensley again, because he's experimented with this a little bit. Uh, and in quite a small niche market, uh, as I recall, Josh was able to make something like 20 bucks uh, on a video that he produced a month or two ago. And that is just a very small example, the microcosm of what's possible. To, to make $20 with YouTube content could take you six months. You may never achieve it, actually, regardless of the value of your content, because you just, you don't hit the metrics that they want to see. And you also can't really audit it very well. And maybe you never get to the minimum threshold for them to send you a payment because of, you know, the, the payment minimums on all kinds of things. But if you can directly monetize and I can just click, Hey, I want to watch Josh's video and I'm willing to pay 10 cents right now. Uh, and then it's instantly streamed to me. Like that is a huge disruptive thing for the value of information. And then it can also be in written content uh, and all kinds of other things. I, I think another great example is really a simple one. Uh, I get people that send me New York Times articles often, and I am not a New York Times subscriber. And so I get the, hey, pay $2.99 or whatever it is to, to subscribe to the New York Times, read this article. And I'm already a little irritated because I just don't want to get out a credit card or do any of that. But if I decide I really want to read the thing and you go through the process, you realize, well, it's not just $2.99 because they don't want to process something that small. They make you pay for 12 months. And so now we're actually talking about $36 or something with, with the taxes involved and all that. So now I'm thinking about, do I actually want to spend 36 bucks? I'm probably going to read an article a month or something. And like, what's, what's the actual value of that? But with Bitcoin and in a Bitcoin powered world, uh, I could just pay three cents or five cents. Uh, the, these are the opportunities for me to say, hey, you know what, maybe I'll bid, maybe I'll set a price that I'm willing to pay. Maybe I ask the New York Times very trivially, hey, can I pay you a penny instead of three? Because I don't, I only, I only want to read one paragraph. And like, you know, those kind of things were, were not possible to do with the ad model and the credit card model, uh, Web2, PayPal, and Visa, basically. Uh, but they are possible in Web3 and Bitcoin. And so uh, we can go further and say that uh, websites themselves can even be streamed from tokens. We can have a global internet archive that can't be censored, can't be stopped. Uh, you can go a million miles with this stuff, um, but that's that's a couple of basic examples. But this really can be a complete change of the way that the entire distribution of the internet uh, occurs. Yeah, and and just to kind of reiterate on that, for anyone that's looked at our investor deck here at you know Unbounded Capital, that is like the first or second example we have in terms of what you know we're really excited for payments and you know what some of our portfolio companies are working on now but just to make sure everyone listening is aware uh we're very much aligned with kind of kurt's vision for um you know what we think is probably a likely bitcoin powered but some type of scalable blockchain powered you know internet and there's just a lot of things that are not possible without you know having the ability to extremely cheaply and reliably put data on a public database and you know that is kind of at the core of almost everything that we're investing in. Um, so we have a question now from Bannon Capital uh, partner, Dave Mullenmore. Uh, I'm curious to learn more about how ARC makes transaction broadcasting and processing more efficient. Is there a TLDR in layman's terms? I think, so you would need to have some experience with either trying to directly broadcast yourself uh, or using Mappy, both, both of which are things that you might do as a company or, or as the, the technical person at a company. Um, if you've done those things a couple of times, you know what the limitations are. <laughs> uh, and a lot of it is, is just weird timeouts or missing inputs, or there's all kinds of issues with uh, Mappy specifically. Mappy was designed for people to be able to send transactions directly to a miner. And it, when it works, it works fine, but uh, its failure rate is pretty high. And the reason for it is that uh, it's very linear in the way that it treats transactions. So um, 
you'll you'll connect to one node and it will ask the node if something is valid. Uh, if the node says yes, then Mappy says yes, and it tells you, hey, we've received your valid transaction. Or it could do the same thing, this is invalid, and then, then Mappy will tell you that it's invalid. But that might not be true. And the reason why it might not be true is that uh, it might be true only for that given node on the network, whereas uh, other nodes on the network might say a different thing because maybe something was broadcast that you're trying to um, build upon was broadcast on the other side of the network. And there is a little bit of network latency globally, uh, which you wouldn't think would be a problem. But when you're trying to transact uh, millions of times in a, in a second or a minute, uh, or even in an hour in, in some circumstances, the segregation that is inherent in the network because of latency uh, causes false positives and false negatives. And then when you go to mine them, uh, there, you just kind of get this chaos in um, what, what appear to be invalid or appear to be valid and then aren't. And then it's just, it's, it's, it's a problem. And it was a fundamental issue with Mappy. So what Arc does is Arc connects to a minimum of three nodes, but you can connect to more. And then it also connects directly to the peer-to-peer -peer network uh, over RPC. So in that way, it kind of works like a node. Um, and what it does is if a transaction comes back, is rejected for some reason, it will just rebroadcast it back to the network. So you don't have to manually reset uh, and do a bunch of the, the kludgy stuff that was pretty common uh, in, the, in the Mappy era. Now, Arc is super new, so we don't know what bugs uh, might <laughs> Uh, creep up when we're, we're hitting new world record uh, transaction speeds or that kind of thing. But uh, so far, uh, for example, we saw like 50 million transactions just about, I don't know, 10 days ago. Uh, and everything seemed to work really fine. That was a new world record and it was literally without incident. So uh, we were quite happy with how it performed in that regard. That was about a five, well, let's see. No, it was about a three X improvement uh, over the previously set world record. And that previously set world record literally knocked like half the network, like literally whole mining pools uh, were losing nodes that were uh, unable to sink and, and all kinds of things. And we, we have able to make like this 300% improvement uh, in total transactions. And literally everybody stayed online. There was no, uh, there actually wasn't even an uptick in orphans. There were no lost transactions. It was really, really, really uh, encouraging that, that we've tightened a lot of things up considerably. Uh, I see Dave's follow-up. So yeah, the UX for a dev pushing out transactions is similar to Mappy, but it works much better. Yeah, absolutely. So the documentation is basically, uh, here's, here's your API. It doesn't even require API keys. You literally broadcast it without authentication um, and, and you send your transactions. So it's, it's quite simple to use from a UI standpoint. It's just the guts. The guts of it are, are completely different from Mappy. And um, so far we're really, uh, really encouraged by what we're seeing. Uh, David, your turn on the camera. So it looks like you probably want to ha ask a question. So if you want to unmute yourself, um, your oh, floor is yours. No, hey, Zach. No, hey. just listening to this fascinating conversation. You know, been following this stuff for a long time. Do I have a question? I've attended, you know, many of your in-person events. I guess here's my question. Do people still expect to get real rich doing this stuff? And here's why I asked this question. So all the life science, bioscience, venture capital I've done for 25 years, everybody expects to get rich. They also expect to cure cancer and heart disease and diabetes and all that, to do good stuff. But they expect to get very rich by doing it because they put their whole life into it. And there's a lot of work that's involved. And all of the SaaS and other stuff that we've been involved with over the years. Now, payments. Everybody in the world has to deal with payments. So it's like oxygen. So if a small number of really smart people figure out how to do lots of transactions, whether it's you know, BSV or some other protocol, do a small number of people then expect to get really, really rich? Fil I, I use the word filthy rich only in the sense of, doesn't that begin to make people say, oh my God, a small number of people are getting so rich doing this stuff, Governments, we, we know why this is happening because people don't trust governments for good reason. Governments are screwed up all over the place. So it's supposed to be a better 
distributed trust environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, you don't expect the senators and the congressmen necessarily to be being senators and congressmen just to get rich, although some of them do. You expect them to be public servants. Where does that kind of public servant, which seems to me Satoshi's original vision was kind of that, this sort of utopian, new dynamic pie that everybody participates in. But a lot of what happened with the internet, whether it's 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, is a small number of people, SBF and other things, ended up putting themselves in positions, and maybe the system put them in that position to get really, really rich, and then they disappointed, and there was fraud and all of that. So now there's kind of a reset in theory taking place. But there's still guys like you know, Novogratz and Winklevosses and all of that. And it sure seems to me, listening to them, that their plan is to get really, really rich doing this. And yep. we did this and we made all this happen and you're all going to be able to use this system. But whether you're in Kenya or Madagascar or Paris or New York or San Francisco, we should be dipping our cup into those waters every time and get really, really rich. And then doesn't that ultimately undermine what you're trying to do. Maybe I'm being too philosophical here, but I'm just wondering how this reset plays out over the next year or two, yeah. given the debacle that's taken place and given human nature. I hope that question makes sense. Sure. I, I actually think, so yeah, I mean, we saw Bitcoin, I mean, Bitcoin is almost 15 years old at this point. And I think a lot of people look at it and say, well, have we, have we failed? <laughs> and so um, like, we really haven't disrupted the payment space in, in any uh, meaningful sense. It's become a great investment for people that got in early. And then there's plenty of, uh, you know, crypto trading nonsense uh, that has made a pretty small amount of people a lot of money, uh, at least paper money. I don't I don't know how liquid any of it actually is when people try to cash out. But um, I think, you know, I, I've actually written about this and I've done a lot of podcasts at length. I, I think the legacy payment space, because, because Bitcoin really does disrupt everyone from the credit card companies to the bank wire infrastructure people and ACH wire and Fed wire and just all, all these other things. It really does put a lot of them on very shaky ground. I, I, I think we saw the investment come from them uh, going back into the 2014 and 15 era and created these incubators uh, that, that turned this into a trading economy. Like, hey, let's treat this as an opportunity to have you know pink sheets on weird offshore exchanges and, and you can get really rich by be, being a trader. Uh, and, and I think that overshadowed heavily the ability to disrupt the payment space. Um, but we've stayed focused. And by we, I mean, a few of us, <laughs> like the guys at Unbounded are, are a big exception looking at that value um, to say, hey, this is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity uh, to reduce the friction by 99% of global payments. And if we can figure out business models that that do that, then, I mean, it, it really is. In my opinion, I still think this is the biggest opportunity to make the most amount of money uh, in, in, our, in our lifetimes. Um, well, that's true. You see, I mean, anytime you get a corner on oxygen or you've got, you know, the cancer cure or, or, or something like that, Everybody needs it. They need the oxygen. They cure my cancer. But, yeah. but what happens is then people say, you're not going to cure my cancer. You're not going to give my kid the cure, et cetera. What do I have to do to, you know, to F you up, to get it? What do I have to do to, you know, to, 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 to get all of the, the troops lined up and storm the gates? And I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not being facetious and I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. I mean, look at the implosion of what's taking place in the financial system now. Yeah. We're supposed to all have been kind of put on more of an even keel, Don Frank and all of that, and political considerations. Again, I, I don't want to get too broad here. There's a there's an opportunity for a reset. And every time I've heard you speak, you speak very compellingly. I've, I've seen you live and I've seen you in, in Unbounded. And yeah. I, I would hope that, but what's the name of that? Uh, Duran, Lanier, that's the you know, guy with the dreadlocks, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. musician guy. And he's been writing about these kinds of issues for 20, 25 years. I remember reading his first book way back when. And saying that one of his books is the thing is, I am not a gadget. You know, that whole mindset, I'm not a gadget, I'm a human being. You know, give me things which are going to make my life better and the people I care and love about better. But don't drag me into a place where my whole life is dependent on this thing. And suddenly, you know, like the who, we won't get fooled again. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm old enough that 
I've been through so many cycles of this. I mean, I was drafted into the Vietnam War and had to think about going to Canada or Israel to get the hell out of that crazy thing. Yeah. So you see, you see these cycles. And at the end of the day, it's like something fundamental about human nature. Since I'm a physician, I deal with that all the time. Kind of gets lost in the euphoria, the, the, the justifiable euphoria of the unbelievable power of the technologies and yeah. the potential impact to disrupt. I mean, in Pesa in, 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 in Kenya, I mean, that's had such an impact being able to do payments on, on the cell. And there seems to be real trust associated with it. Does that now become like Web 3.0, 4.0, whatever it is, and it goes to all over the world? Or do a few people behind the scenes say, ah, let's get everybody hooked and then we'll be the puppet masters and we'll be the filthy trillionaires. No, I don't I know. Think, I, I think ultimately, so I mean, we'll, we'll get much more equitable uh economics out of it because it really isn't like it's an underlying protocol it's like the internet itself like i can build a really great internet business so like jeff bezos for example built a very powerful internet business but he doesn't really control the internet i guess in some ways because now a lot of the internet runs on uh, aws he does but but there's still competitors like the, at that level that's really what we're talking about that if you build like bsv itself just bsv's existence is not going to disrupt uh, Swift, which like Swift does something like $15 trillion a day in transfers, like value transfer going over Swift is, is just almost inconceivable. But, but ultimately aren't, that's a good point. Aren't you ultimately trying to put something together that could compete not to kill Swift because Swift's the dragon that you want to slay. Well, but Swift, because you want Swift could be the customer actually. So Swift is its own infrastructure, but if somebody built a business that defined how Swift should perhaps be re-engineered, they should literally be knocking on their door and saying, hey, you can pay me a considerable amount of money to upgrade your systems and you'll have global settlement of Swift using this system now. And, and ultimately you make the whole system better, but that's- Well, okay, but right now, to the best of my knowledge, nobody gets filthy rich on Swift. Like nobody owns the Swift protocol. It's interbank, you know. I mean, you know, Swift is not a public company. You know, Swift right. is uh, so, so David, I think what you're getting at basically yeah. is if, you know, it's kind of an either or of is it going to be a small number of people like so far in crypto that just get really rich or is it going to be this equitable thing kind of for right. the masses? And I think it's right. both. I think if you look at kind of the history of, you know, capitalism, the history of how nations have flourished over the past however many decades, there is a strong correlation between a small number of people getting rich from creating real value and value being you know, created and transmitted for the society at large. So I think the main thing to keep in mind when people are getting rich is not so much, okay, is it a few people getting rich, but how are they doing it? Are they yeah, doing no, I understand, it in a, but before, in a positive before... sum game or kind of a negative sum game? When totally. you look at dictators that steal from their people, when you look at kind of you know, crypto people pumping Ponzi's, these are negative sum games where they're taking. Yep and you know making everything worse but i think when you look at infrastructure that allows people to you know invest pay remittent you know much smaller amounts of money it's no only i get the idea it may, may it only yeah. be inshallah baruch Hashem, or, or may it only work out that way here's one other question before you finished if you want to take it where does ai chat gpt or other types of i mean the, this, that's a good example of another tsunami that just is knocking everything i know in my field in healthcare the speed with which we're looking at different ways of integrating it and still trying to figure out how the doctor-patient relationship is preserved. Because yeah. if it's all chat GPT and, and video you know, diagnosis and all of that, something really profound that helps in healing is lost. And I think that carries over into, into other realms. Is there an impact of these accelerations in, in, in the technology in that sphere that impact on everything related to crypto, blockchain, I think you know, BSV, et cetera? I think the most crucial thing for it to do is is sort of use like a check valve. So a lot of people are afraid that, you know, AI is going to turn into Terminator, right? Like this is the, we've seen a million movies where the AI takes yeah, over. Yeah, that, but that's, that, that's not the worry. That, yeah, I agree. That's, well, that's but, it, but it, it kind of could be. And that, it, like, yeah. I don't think it's going to be nearly like an action movie, but, you know, there are versions of this that turn into a dystopia. But what I like about the ability for really, really small payments is that they can be used as a check valve where you know the AI only has access to certain information if it is paying, and I, I say paying in a very um, small set, maybe a 10,000th of a penny to access a certain thing. But maybe if, uh, for example, you can use it as a floodgate for access to 
uh, much more sensitive information or the ability to check out like medical data, for example. Yeah. So a drug, yeah. a drug trial, like the, the biggest part of the drug trial is to make sure that it was done correctly. Like nobody can just get the drug because, you know, it was done out of turn and then the entire thing has to be scrapped. So part of uh, using the data from that drug trial could require that, um, you know, various payments are made and that the people who participated in it are, are paid out. So it can be used as a valve for access, but it can also be used as a way to distribute uh, royalties or, or, you know, however that needs to work. So you can kind of change the funding model uh, in both the way that data is accessed, but also the way um, the way that you can uh, put valves on it to stop AI from being able to just access everything, uh, at least without paying for it, or to make it and say, you know what, I just don't want it to have that data, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna turn it off. And so if the internet is built like this using blockchain, a, a metanet system, uh, you can have any data that you don't want touched. You can you can have it fully encrypted and only accessible. Uh, using using this new system, so right. There's a, I mean, some a lot of, the, of some of the that. other some of the other things. I just saw a link that's been passed around a lot. Where I forget who it was developed the whole using like it was like oh, it was a professor of finance at NYU or whatever, and said I, I, he gave his students thirty minutes to develop a whole application, a website, and a marketing campaign, and a and a software mashup protocol, etc to do something, uh, maybe it was an e-commerce or something. And in 30 minutes, using 4.0, they were able to do the work that the professor said would have taken some of his best students, you know, a few months ago, weeks to have done. And then of course there was some tinkering. This was in 30 minutes. So maybe what, what happens is some of the applications, whether it's BSV or, or other things, which are used, like, like you go out and say, do a BSV, um, scaffolded solution for the following in this country that enables the maximum sure. number of people to do such and such and goes out and, and presents it. And not only presents yeah. the code for it, but gives you a marketing campaign. It gives you materials no, sure. to explain it, et cetera. That really accelerates yeah. potentially the penetration of all the stuff you're doing in, in, in a way that couldn't be possible because of just the man hours that would be needed. I don't know. No, for sure. It seems we're, to me something like that. We're, yeah. we're already using it in development, actually. So you can propose mm. code and tell it what problem you need to solve and it'll debug your code and, and you know, do, do all kinds of crazy things and get you to like 99% in 20 minutes instead of days. So it, right. it, it is right. a very impressive tool for okay. those. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Well, uh, David, thank you for the the questions as always and uh thanks for our, our stragglers that stayed till the end and over and until until next time have a great day everyone thanks for having me okay thanks Bye. kurt thanks zach